All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for truth that sets us free. Thank you for bringing this family together so faithfully, Father, in the midst of this crooked and perverse world. This is a place of refuge, a place to be re-energized, washed over by your word. What an incredible grace gift this is, Father. May we never become familiar with it but embrace it for what it is, an expression of your divine love towards your children. Father, we pray for those in the congregation that aren't here that for whatever reasons are withheld or put off. We pray that you humble them, that you heal them, and that they return to the fold in your good timing, of course. We pray for for those that are lost in this world, Father, that exist without hope in a world that's just destitute of your love and grace. Father, we just pray for them that they be humbled, repent, receive saving faith that we have additional brothers and sisters in Christ for all of eternity. We especially pray for this morning's message, that it be edifying for our souls We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Part 86, the book of Hebrews. Uh, We need to get back into the swing of things, obviously, regarding the book of Hebrews. We've been out and away from our main course of study now for a few weeks. Um, Before our special messages the past couple of weeks, we had a, you know, sort of a punchline with our blog. Uh, And this goes back a few weeks. Uh, But that will help us get us situated. Um, Now, as we do open up here, keep your eye on what the Spirit's imposing and has been imposing on our souls. It is rightly called fear. We had a blog a few weeks back titled, Why Are We Not All Dead? That was on December 29th. And to summarize, sin in God's eyes, is a capital offense. It's worthy of death. He said, if you disobey me, you're going to die. That was in Genesis, right? And so to summarize, in God's eyes, sin is worthy of death. And so the question is, since we're all sinners, why are we not all dead? And that started the blog, right? And that started sort of the, or instigated the, the point that the Spirit wanted to make in that blog. For starters, if we all got what we deserved, and I'm quoting from this blog, if we all got what we deserved, we'd all get God's justice and we'd all be dead and in hell. And there's not a person here, or that it's ever existed, that would say that that's unjust or that we didn't deserve it. Because we're all sinners. We all deserve hell. So if we all got what we deserved, we'd be in hell. Remember, God has never been unjust. That has to be cemented in your soul. He's never been unjust. He's never punished a soul who didn't deserve it. Never. Not once. Every person that's ever been punished, including those who will spend eternity in hell, deserve to be there. They've earned it. In our last installment of the series, the Spirit had us reflect on uh, Luke 6, which is where Jesus described a subtle type of hypocrisy to his disciples. It's where Jesus talks about how much easier it is to love someone, for example, who loves you. It's easy, right? It's a lot easier to love someone who loves you. But the point Jesus was really getting at was hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is destructive to our own peace as God's children. He repeatedly says, even sinners do the same regarding loving, lending, and doing good to others. So there's this practical aspect that Jesus had no problem ever bringing out. 
contemporary Christians do. They want it to be all academic, and then they want to go and live like hell. Jesus never had a problem with the practical aspects of the faith. He said, look, don't be a hypocrite. Even sinners can, can love when someone loves them, can lend when they're expecting something in return like interest, can do good to others when there's something in it for them. Even sinners do all that kind of stuff. So let's just cut to the chase, shall we? And if you think about this ministry specifically, that's a big portion of it. I've had others outside the ministry, other pastors, especially overseas, say, I get it, Your ministry, because every ministry is different. Same spirit, but different ministries, right? This one is very practical. The Spirit never lets us off the hook. He never lets us just absorb some doctrine or some academic truth from Scripture, which helps. He always says, no, no, okay, that's good. You get it? And everybody's like, yeah, I get it. Yay. And he says, what about you? How does this manifest in your life? So you love those who love you? Big deal. You lend to some, expecting something in return? Big deal. You do good to others? Well, there's something in it for you. Big deal. That's all stuff that sinners do, that unbelievers do. So let's get to the truth of the matter. Let's get practical. Jesus never had a problem with that. Obviously, this ministry has never had a problem with that. So to sort of net-net what the Spirit was saying, <clears throat> you are in possession of Christ-like love until you love like he did. And that's the litmus test. You aren't in possession of Christ-like love until you love like he did. The interesting thing about godly love, you know, and lending and doing good, etc., is that it is gracious by nature. Now, grace is a big word. It's perverted in contemporary Christianity, but nonetheless, it's a big word in the Bible. It's fundamental if you're ever going to understand God's will uh, in your life and the way that he is by nature, being gracious. So the thing about godly love is it is gracious by nature. Grace meaning that you give, grace gives without strings attached or even preconditions. For example, well, if you love me first, I'll love you back. That's not grace. That's not godly love. That's conditional love. That's something that. Um, even unbelievers are capable of. That's not Christ-like love. And so the key principle was grace gives without any expectations. Otherwise, it's not grace. If there's a payment, whether it's forward or on the tail end of the transaction, then it's not grace. If there's some kind of a payment or some, something in it for you, for the giver, then it's not truly grace. It's somehow tainted. Grace gives without any expectations, either front or back. No prepayment, no postpayment. Jesus also turns the tables on us in this passage where he's talking about hypocrisy. He says in summary, how do you... So he says, okay, so that's, you know, you being given. Most of us put us in that position, put ourselves in that position. You know, is that... Is that me? But then he says, what about the other side as well? What about when you're the receiver and you're looking at someone who's supposedly being gracious to you? How do you wish to receive love from others? What's the best kind of love? When do you need love the most? Do you want strings attached? Allah we might say this sort of hovers around that idea of the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Right? Do you want strings attached? Of course not. Otherwise, said love received is tainted by some kind of, let's call it keeping score. Um, it can mean, you know, it, it's not godly love that there's something in it for the giver, and that taints it, does it not? When you know that someone's coming at you and saying, I love you, and you're saying, I don't trust you. You're only saying that because I said it to you first, 
Oh, you're only saying that so, this, so you can get something out of me. And you sense it. And so the love itself that you're receiving is tainted. So you have to turn both things around. Now, the bigger question is, imagine if God kept score. Thinking of Romans 5, 8, for while we were still sinners, while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly, for example. But imagine if God kept score. He said, there's got to be some kind of payment. Hmm. No one really wants to find out that the only reason someone loves them is because they can get something out of them. Because that's a selfish type of love that breeds misery. Even if it seems great at the start of the relationship, selfish love always destroys relationships because people always fail each other. Selfish love always destroys relationships, eventually. It may start off well. Oh, we're in love. You love me, I love you. La, la, la. And then someone fails, and it's like, I thought you loved me. I don't like you anymore. My love is gone, too. Let's get a divorce. Let's part ways. That's not godly love, and that's what happens. We don't have time to get into this any more than what I've already stated. In any case, let's read Jesus' words again. Go to Luke 6.31. Luke 6.31 Again, we're just regaining our footing here where we were, what, almost four weeks ago now. If you think about it, a couple of Sundays. We missed a Sunday. We had a Sunday special. <clears throat> so we've got to get back to where we were. Luke 6.31, And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. That's the so-called golden rule, right? Jesus is turning the tables around. And says, hey, look, this thing that I'm talking about, this hypocrisy, it goes in two directions. Like, you don't want to be a hypocrite, and you don't want a hypocrite to be supposedly giving you love or lending or doing good to you. So there's this golden rule that sort of encapsulates the sphere of it all. And then look at verse 36. A lot of emphasis on mercy last time. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. In other words, abide in the sphere of mercy. So Jesus' point was that unless you're gracious towards others, giving without expectations, then you won't receive the blessing of being a loving, lending, good person. Unless you're gracious towards others, giving without expectation. In other words, you just dive headlong into the sphere of it. You just say, this is who I am. If you do it with strings attached the way that unbelievers are able to, who can never enter the sphere of God, then you miss out on actually being a loving, lending, good person. You must abide in the entirety of love in order to fully enjoy its benefits. And that was a lot of what uh, Scott taught on Thursday. Paraphrasing, you know, what good is life without love? You know, everything kind of falls dead on the floor without meaning, without purpose, without even emotions or feeling that matter if you don't have love. But you have to abide in the entirety of love to fully enjoy its benefits. This is what Jesus wrote about when he described abiding in the sphere of God's love. Go to John 15, 8. John 15, verse 8. See, this is, this is what I love about Jesus' teaching is because he's very practical, right? He doesn't just state doctrine. Obviously, everything he says is uh, based on doctrine, on God's word. But he always draws us to the practical side of things. John 15, 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. Now, is that not a practical thing? Of course it is. Don't just sit there, you know, as a tree, bear some fruit. 
because that's what trees do. Right? I am the vine, you are the branches, this whole thing. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Prove also implies practical outpouring or doing the word of God. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love, Allah, in the sphere of it. And next he gets to the how-to. He says, abide in my love. This is what I want. How-to? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And his commandments aren't passive. They require activity, behavior even. Thinking, talking, moving, doing. He never had a problem with that, nor should any of us. It doesn't make any sense if we have a problem with it. That's dead faith, if you think in terms of James. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. This is the how-to section. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. In other words, then he gets to the results of this. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And that echoes this past week's blog, Stop Playing the Victim. You want joy in your life, stop playing the victim. And then he gets to verse 12 and just like, hammers the nail home. He said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And was his love passive? No way. Was his love impractical and merely academic? No way. Greater love is no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. If that's not practical, I don't know what is. Right? It's like John says, and I think it's uh, at the tail end. Mm, maybe it's John, 1 John 1. You know, someone says, oh, hey, be blessed, have a great day, see you later, and then you don't do anything? That's not love. That's not brotherly love. That's not actually doing the word of God. That's not laying down your life. That's talking a big game. Hey, you know, And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with prayer. There's a place for it. It's wonderful. But that cannot be the end of it. Oh, hey, been thinking about you, been praying for you. Oh, oh, sorry, see you later. Tom Brady's on. Does that not epitomize most people, most Christians? You bet. You bet. Greater love is knowing than this that they lay down their life for their friends. There's a practical aspect here. So last installment in this series, and again, we're about a month out, we talked about a subtle, covert form of hypocrisy. What I just described is hypocrisy. Love you, but I got to run. I see you got problems. When I get a second, I'll pray for you. I'll be thinking about you. Click. The Spirit coupled all of this with another blog in between titled, Talk is Cheap. Right? And I got a couple of excerpts from that. That was on January 5th. Here's a quote from Talk is Cheap, the blog. I believe what Jesus was getting at in Luke 6, 27 to 36 was simple. He wants to test our virtues the hard way. It's easy to talk a big game when the situation is conducive to godly behavior. In other words, yeah, you love because someone loves you, that type of thing. It isn't until our so-called virtues are challenged under difficult circumstances that we can truly stake a claim to them. Another excerpt from that same blog, Talk is Cheap. Let us recognize our own hypocrisy before anyone else needs to. Let's take it upon ourselves. Am I a hypocrite? It doesn't, it's between you and the Lord. 
But let us do that at least. Let us look in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm pretty much a hypocrite. Maybe not in everything, but in these certain areas of my life, these certain circumstances, I'm still not there yet. I'm pretty much a hypocrite. I'm kind of selfish. You know, I'll do something, but I just want to make sure somebody else knows I'm doing it so I get some creature credit out of it or something. Well, there's some return on investment. You know, I'm going to do it. There's money in it for me. There's reward in it for me. There's, you know, attaboys. I don't know what it is. Right? Something's always in it for you. Let us call ourselves hypocrites when it's the truth. Let us look in the mirror with intent and humility. We want to know the truth about ourselves, don't we? After all, it's truth that sets us free. Let us confess our own weaknesses, because that's what that is, and aim to help those who are weaker still by showing them grace, mercy, and love. This is the Lord's will for us. That was from that blog, Talk is Cheap. So I would highly recommend rereading the last three blogs in the, in the order in which they were given to us. Go ahead and do it. Like it, It'll be fun. What's it going to take you, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? I know, I know, Tom Brady's on. Is he still playing, by the way? Does Tom Brady even play? Everybody's like, I'm not saying. <laughs> that would imply. No, is he for real? He's not? He retired? All right, see, that goes to show. We know one person that's not watching it. <laughs> Read the blogs. All right, with that said, it's time to head on back to our primary course of study. I want to recap very quickly where we're coming from to ensure we don't lose sight of the overarching theme being developed in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Remember, before uh, a month ago when we left off, we were just transitioning out of chapter 3 which was a healthy warning, if you want to call it that. Then chapter 4 gets a little bit deeper, right? There was sort of this, you're going to lose rest if you don't X, Y, Z. You're going to be like those in the wilderness. That was the example. Chapter 4 gets a little bit more um, direct. So recall at the tail end of chapter 3, the writer placed the dire warning of consequences of unbelief before his audience. Go to Hebrews 3.19. Hebrews 3.19. All right. This was sort of our point of transition. So we see that they were unable to enter. Rest is what's in view because of unbelief. As the Spirit pointed out last time, this unbelief is tantamount to disobedience. Those things have to be fused in our souls because that's the way the Bible presents them. Unbelief is tantamount to disobedience. So the key for us is to never let go of the simple statement that unbelief is disobedience in God's eyes. The perfect example is the gospel command, the command to believe. Some people say no. What do we call it? Unbelief. God has a command for his children. We disobey. Obviously, we don't believe it's the best thing for us, do we? Otherwise, in other words, it's called unbelief. So unbelief is disobedience in God's eyes. This may also be stated in the reverse order which may be helpful in your understanding the fullness of what Holy Scripture teaches us regarding this topic. To flip it, disobedience is unbelief in God's eyes. What I mean to say here is rather simple. To disobey God is to say in your heart that you don't trust that His will is, right, is the right way for you. I'll say it again. To disobey God is to say in your heart, and therefore your actions, that you don't trust that His will, what He wants for you, is the right way for you. That's what you're saying. You're saying, I, I, understand, I understand what the Bible is telling me. I, I see the command. I'm just not going to do it. Why is that? Why do you disobey a command? Because you don't trust God. You trust that there's something else that you're about to do that would supplant that, that you think is better. 
You're choosing your will over his. That's the very definition of disobedience. <laughs> and it comes out, it manifests in your actions. But at the core of it, it's distrust, lack of faith. In other words, by your actions, you're saying you don't trust God. So you reject his will for you. In other words, you disobey. Regardless of the, quote, direction in which you read those statements that I just gave you, the end result is the same. Allah, the writer of Hebrews, warning. Disobedience results in failure to enter God's rest. So that's the outcome. He's tying this disobedience, uh, this unbelief even, to failure to enter God's rest. And that's what we learned in chapter 3. That was sort of the crescendo. They did not enter because of unbelief. And we applied that to our own lives because that's what the Spirit wanted. But what about your rest? Why don't you have rest? Where's your peace right now? I don't know. If you don't have it, you're probably disobeying somewhere that you needed to think about, you need to examine. So that's the capstone statement the writer of Hebrews made at the end of chapter 3. Again, 319. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Very definite statement. Because of unbelief. So, let's get practical here for a moment. What does this principle mean to you? What does it mean to you? It's great to read Holy Scripture and seek to understand what the writer of a book intended to convey to his audience, you know, a couple of thousand years ago. Seems When it's that far away, it almost seems academic by nature, right? You're like, oh, it was like 2,000 years ago. I'll learn about it, but it's like a history lesson. That's not how the Bible works. The Bible is present tense. We learn, but it's meant to be applied to our lives. God's will is that you apply what you've learned to your life. That's what he wants. He doesn't want you just to learn it. Otherwise, you become just another sophomore, a wise moron. Sophomore. Sophos moros. Wise moron. In other words, someone that knows Bible doctrine but never does it, fails to achieve the godly outcome. And that's what James's warning was, right? That faith is dead. Faith without works is what? Dead. You say you trust in God. You say you believe. Those are two of the same things, remember? But you disobey. The proof is in the pudding. Therefore, your faith that you cling to is dead. James 1.22, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Jesus impressed this concept of being, quote, doers into the souls of his disciples regarding a much more catastrophic issue. We can always go back to the, to the gospel, Right? That's sort of the catastrophic example that we have um, in terms of, we'll call it positional sanctification. We as believers are concerned, in addition, with progressive, or as some might say, experiential sanctification, what happens after you're saved. But the principles are the same, right? There's a commandment to believe. And if you believe... You're delivered, you're saved, whether it's positionally or experientially. Go to Matthew 7.24, where Jesus primarily is talking about doing the gospel, not just hearing it and deluding ourselves, like a lot of people sadly do, guaranteed, without a doubt, beyond a shadow of any doubt, even according to Holy Scripture, there are people right now in a quote, church building, they're not believers. They're just going through the motions. They're not doing the Word of God. They're hearing it. They're, you know, mouthing it. They're 
you know, parroting it back, but they're actually not doing it. Um, Matthew 7, 24, Jesus' words, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. How harsh is it going to be when someone says, but, 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 and Jesus says, I never knew you. Ouch! How great of a fall is that going to be? How many people are in a church right now thinking they're saved and they hear that at the end of it? I never knew you. Ouch! Great was the fall of it. The writer of Hebrews was doing his very best to remind his audience of Holy Scripture so that they'd be more inclined to do it. You read just up one chapters 1 through 3, that's what he's saying. He's like, we've got to do this stuff. To do Holy Scripture is to abide in it, to abide in the truth as Jesus alluded to in John 15 which isn't merely an academic reality. It's a very practical one. Does that make sense? I think it's wonderful that most of you in here by now, I'm assuming, understand what I'm teaching. Understand the baselines. right? Like I've said a million times, the, the, the primitives in the Bible are not difficult. The gospel is actually very simple. What makes it difficult is your flesh and mine. And what my job basically is to surgically navigate around all the excuses and the skeletons in the closets and all the preconditions and these preconceived notions that you have uh, and all of that to get to the truth like you know Hebrews 4.12 cut right to the bone use the word of God that's the only thing that can get there but get there that way get through all the BS let's call it that's the only reason it's difficult if we were pure, this would be easy. I'd just come up here and remind you of the gospel. And we'd just be like, isn't it wonderful? But you're not pure. I know. <gasps> right? And you're still clinging to garbage, and you've still got these preconceived notions about what godliness even is. That's my job. Right? To do Holy Scripture is to abide in it, to abide in the truth, as Jesus alluded to in John 15, which isn't merely an academic reality. It's a very practical one. He said, if you keep my commandments, if you do this, in other words, you will abide in my love. That's how you get in to the sphere. That's how you be these things. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That was John 15, 10. And then he said, in succession, which really is a summary of all I've been teaching here this morning in John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Why would he say that? Because he loves us. He really does want us to have joy. And then verse 12, he says, this is my commandment. In other words, there's no other way just to make sure that you understand what I'm saying here. I can encourage you. I can tell you why. I can give you a glimpse into my motivation. I really want you to have my joy. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But at the end of the day, you have to do this. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So that's what we need to take with us from chapter 3 to chapter 4, this practical side of things. Again, Hebrews 3.19 so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And unbelief has very practical aspects to it. I think that's what the Spirit's also pointing out here. They're very practical. You have to actually examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine your fruit. Is there proof of your faith? Right? Jesus said that's how people will know. That's how 
you'll prove that you're my disciples because you will bear much fruit. <laughs> right? Now, we know from all our context setting that the author was fearful of this congregation's salvation, not holistically. He spoke charitably like I do, but he saw the history, and he saw that some people had already apostatized, and it scared him. So he wrote about and included this sense of fear in his sermon here. So again, from all our context setting, we remember that the writer was fearful of this congregation's salvation. That laced in his writing was an ever-present sense of immediacy and fear that some would defect from the faith altogether and apostatize as some had already done. And from a pastor's perspective, that's really any pastor's fear, frankly. Like, I watch some of you that I, I'm convinced are saved. I mean, I, only God knows, but I'd be hard-pressed to think otherwise. Um, and it does, there is a certain amount of fear to watch people, I call it the watching a car wreck in slow motion, watching somebody do something stupid or against God's will that you know is going to end poorly. That's painful. But at least I know I have a brother or sister that's going to be with me in heaven, and I'm going to be like, all right, well, you're going to pay for that. <laughs> just, you know, just throwing it out there. That's one thing. But it's scary to think about other people who may be lost forever. And when I think about hell, I can't think about it too long. It's too much. It's horrible. So we never, any good pastor, we never want to see anyone reject God's truth, especially as it pertains to his gospel. To put it succinctly in context here, salvation demands obedience. And that's what the writer kept coming back to. Because of unbelief, because of disobedience. So from last time, we have this principle that God has placed conditional promises before us. To obey, in other words, to have faith, is to receive them. And it's okay to have conditional promises. It's okay to read that in Holy Scripture because that's what's there. Last time, the Spirit introduced us to a very important theme that runs throughout this beautiful book. It is forfeiture. Now, forfeiture is a big word that requires some synthesis in our souls. We have to, like, receive that, receive the truth that the Bible states it, that someone can actually forfeit their salvation before they're even physically dead. That that does and can happen. And there's a name for it called apostasy. Right? It's a big word. And when you factor that in, it has a huge ripple effect in the rest of what you believe to be true. When you read your Bible, all of a sudden this thing is there. And it has an effect. It has a ripple effect. That's all I can tell you. The, the idea of pot, nobody wants to talk about it. That's part of the problem. Because it is very upsetting to the soul to think about Uncle Jimmy who basically said, you can keep Jesus. I know who he is. I know what he's about. I know what he's offering. I've heard it, been there, done that. I don't want it. That, to me, is horrible. But it's true. Here's an analogy. All analogies fall short, but bear with me. In baseball, if you don't have enough players to fill a roster, you must forfeit the game to your opponent. I've had that happen. Remember Chris? A couple, probably a couple of times, right? Chris and I used to play baseball together. And uh, if the you know, kids didn't show up, if you, only you know, seven kids showed up, you can't, field the, you can't play the game because you can't put enough people in the field to actually play the game. 
on your side. So you end up having to forfeit. So this means that when the win-loss record at the end of the season is tallied, your team will receive a loss and your opponent a win, even though you never played the game. Usually there's a time limit set by officials of the baseball game that says if your team doesn't show up by so many minutes after the official start of the game, you forfeit. And that's it. It's like a gavel comes down. There's like a time limit. Hey, listen, it's 10 minutes after 5 p.m. You don't have enough people. I'm calling it. And the umpire just says, that's it. You lose, you win. You didn't have to play even. That's how it goes. Those are the rules, right? It doesn't even matter if one minute after the forfeiture has been declared, you suddenly have, you know, enough players to play the game. It doesn't matter. The gavel came down. That's it. Once a game is forfeited, that's it. Make sense? It's a one-way thing. That's it. There's no going back. Once it's forfeited, that's it. It's the same concept in the Bible. Go to Mark 8.36. Mark 8.36, we hear a little bit more about this. Mark 8.36. For what... Are you guys there? You know Mark, right? It's one of the Gospels. It's pretty big. It's usually in the middle, kind of middle. Mark 8.36. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? Woohoo! I'm the next Elon Musk. Bill Gates. Right? I'm the next, I don't know, Oprah Winfrey. I got the whole world. I'm a bazillionaire. But I had to forfeit my soul. And as far as I understand, all those three people that I know of, from interviews I've seen, and I'm not saying only God knows, I don't think any of them are saved. They all denounced Christ, as far as I know. Well, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Now, this seems painful to accept as it seems so final, this forfeiture idea. And we Americans are so used to, I was thinking about this. Now think about why this is unpopular in America, specifically. Americans are so used to second chances. We have been conditioned to think that we can even demand second chances after we've already forfeited something. You, I'd be willing to bet some crazed parent in that fictional baseball game that I just told you about, if a kid show, if enough kids showed up one minute after the gavel came down, what would they be saying? Oh, come on! You suck, umpire. What's wrong with you? It's a kid's game. Why are we not playing? Just play the game! They didn't show up on time. Those are the rules. You know what I'm saying, right? Some crazed person would be doing that. Is that fair? Somebody would be complaining that it wasn't fair, and, you know, they demand, uh, uh, you know, whatever. A second opinion, a second chance, come on, you know, blah, 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 all these excuses. No. So we've been conditioned in America to sort of expect, even demand second chances. Abortion, another perfect example of this type of arrogance. A woman goes out and gets pregnant and says, oh darn, this is a mistake. I barely even know this guy. So what does she do? She simply says, oh uh, sorry God, I need a do-over. So I'm going to murder my baby. I need a second chance. You understand. That's the kind of culture we live in today, where even murder is okay as long as the offending person gets that second chance. Does that make sense? That's the kind of world that we live in, where so-called second chances have become the norm, even when they aren't a viable option in God's eyes. Murder is never a viable 
second chance. And yet, it's pretty normal today in America. Back to the point. Forfeiture is final. When God's gavel comes down, that's it. That's it. There's no do-overs. Here's a sneak peek in our book, looking forward briefly, where the writer continues to develop this topic. Go to Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9.27. Okay. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. In other words, there are no do-overs. You can't decide after you're dead, I changed my mind. I now realize that uh, I lived against God's will. I rejected the gospel. But now I, I, I changed my mind. I don't like where I'm at. It's kind of hot in here. Sorry. Sorry. Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. There are no do-overs. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, obviously, this level of forfeiture is, I mean, it's easy to comprehend, because death, physical death, is a definite point in time that we can delineate on. I get it. The person died. That's it. They had their chance. They died. They're off the earth. That's easy for me to kind of get. However, as the Bible clearly teaches us, hopefully you did your homework from a month ago. You were supposed to read Romans 1. As the Bible teaches us, a la Romans 1, not the only place, a forfeiture of salvation can come prior to physical death. You say, oh, man, I, don't, I just don't like the taste of that in my mouth. Too bad. I didn't write the book. A forfeiture of salvation can come prior to physical death. Why? Because God says so. If God's the one who enacts and saves people, then guess what he cannot do? He can say, I'm just not going to, you're done. I don't have to save you. You can do anything he wants, right? So whether you don't like the taste of that is not the issue. The truth is, in Holy Scripture, a forfeiture of salvation can come prior to physical death. And when I say forfeiture, I mean it's final. It's done. They're still alive, but there's nothing left. They don't, that chance is, that ship has sailed. And, you know, that American part of you is like, oh, I don't like that. What about second chances? They're still alive. What about the thief on the cross, huh? Shut up. That's just you trying to find some wiggle room or some clause or disclaimer in Holy Scripture to suit your own human sensibilities. A forfeiture of salvation can come prior to physical death. It comes with something we call apostasy. There's actually a name for it. This is why the writer of Hebrews, and any good pastor, is terrified, and so should you be, of apostasy. Terrified of the idea of apostasy. All of us should be. It's terrifying. Hell is terrifying. Now I want you to I want to take you to another passage that Jesus spoke that speaks to the finality of forfeiture. Go to Luke 16, 19. Luke 16, 19. Luke 16, 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. 
And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment, sort of a foreshadowing of the house. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, Let them hear them. In other words, listen to the word. It's the word that saves after all. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, they don't listen to the word. If they don't do the word, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. That's it. You can't, dude, you're done. You're stuck. What's the base problem? Unbelief. And your brothers are in the same condition as it stands. And they're going to end up in the same place you're in now. And that's it. Forfeiture is final. You can't change your mind after the fact. You can't ever ask for relief. You had your opportunity. Now again, it's easy to see physical death. You say, oh yeah, the rich man was physically dead, I get it, blah, blah, blah. However, forfeiture of salvation can happen prior to physical death. Hence, uh, last time's principle. God, for his own sovereign purposes, will decree a forfeiture of salvation of those who have been enlightened by truth, have understood God's salvific plan, Christ's gospel, and rejected it. We call this apostasy. And that's for his own sovereign purposes. You can read Romans 1 to read about those type of people, and it's not the only place. Hebrews 6. Stated more theologically, the writer introduces the motif of the impossibility of a second repentance after apostasy. We will see this later in chapter 6, chapter 10, and chapter 12. So you need to begin thinking about apostasy in, and I have in my notes here, quote, scary terms. Because I'm telling you, it's scary. Apostasy implies forfeiture. That is a scary thing to think about. That there are people walking around this earth right now that have no chance whatsoever of ever being saved. Because the gavel has come down and God said, I'm done. Have it your way. It's over. I'm the one who regenerates a person. A person is born again by the, my power. I'm not giving it. It's done. For the record, not everyone who's visited a church, I need to say this as a disclaimer because some of you are like, oh crap, that's Uncle Jimmy. Well, that's my son or daughter. Or that's my, fr- well, I don't know, that's my friend. You're not God. So let's have a little real talk right now. 
for the record, not everyone who's visited a church and then left should be considered an apostate. Don't ask me who an apostate is and who isn't. All I know is that they exist. I kind of know what they look like. I know what it means to be one, so I teach it. But I'm not judge and jury here, folks. I can't tell you who an apostate is. I can't tell you that the, you know, the hundred, probably a couple hundred people, I don't even know over the years, right, that have left this church are all apostates. I have no idea. I'm sure probably some of them are. Probably a good chance. But don't ask me where the line in the sand is because I don't know. I just know that they exist. And I'm scared at the very probability that that is real. <laughs> that scares me. It makes me sad. So for the record, not everyone who has visited a church and then left should be considered an apostate. That would be taking what we see in Holy Scripture too far. I'm sure many of you, myself included, had gone to church and maybe even bounced around a bit, were given the gospel accurately, and still rejected it before you finally believed. So the implication here isn't that once you've heard the gospel accurately, that you are somehow an apostate if you didn't immediately believe. Right? Either it didn't sink in, God didn't open your eyes to it at that point in time. I don't know. There's a few different things that could be going on. So don't cast some odd judgment that everybody who's ever come to a church like this that teaches the truth and then left is somehow forever lost. I don't know. They could have been singing la 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 while they're sitting there. Who knows? As I've taught in the past, conversion takes most of us a while. The Bible doesn't teach us that it's a one, you know, one time chance to believe. Like I said last time, I don't know the precise weights and scales that God uses to judge an apostate, and neither do you. I just know that it's real, and that it exists, and that it happens. And that's scary enough for me. Frankly, I don't want to really know, because I don't know how I could look somebody in the eye. If God came down right today and said, hey, you know so-and-so? They're an apostate. They're absolutely going to hell. You can try to evangelize them all you want, but no matter what happens, they're destined to hell. I'd have a hard time looking them in the eye out of sadness. So I don't really want to know. I think that's a grace blessing, to be honest. All I know is that he can and does judge some apostate, and if he does, that's it for them. They forfeited their souls, a la Romans 1. This certain reality was on the writer's heart when he wrote to this audience, Another sneak peek, go to Hebrews 6, 4. Hebrews 6, verse 4. Just a sneak peek of what's coming down the pike. Hebrews 6, 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Possible. All right. So we're out of time for the most part. I want to quickly catch the transition one last time in the contextual connective tissue between 3 and 4, chapters 3 and 4. Go to Hebrews 3.19 again. Hebrews 3.19. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. 4.1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us what? Fear. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. The fear is real. Do you understand? Let us... What is that noise? Is someone outside? Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> Let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them. Why? because they were not united by faith with those who listened. 
That's how it goes. They didn't receive the benefits. They forfeited the benefits. Why? They weren't believers. They didn't trust in God. It's that simple. So chapter 3 describes the forfeiture of God's rest for unbelievers. Chapter 4 outlines, outlines the dire consequences of such disobedience. Key principle, when a person is given the truth, they understand it and still reject it. God holds them accountable. I'll end with a parable that culminates in the proverb, to whom much is given, much is required. Because that's right there. Luke 12, 35. Go there. Luke 12, 35. Luke 12, 35. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? The Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager? whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and to get drunk, The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved the beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required, and from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So there's this doctrine, if we want to call it this, to whom much is given, much is required. Well, guess what? It's a double-edged sword. If you're given the gospel and you flat out reject it, like those who accuse Jesus of wielding the power of Beelzebul in Matthew 12, we call that the blasphemy of the Spirit, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's like thumbing the revelation of truth in the deliverer's face. It's like, yep, yep, I understand. That's essentially what apostasy looks like. You got to kind of net it out. Yep. Go to Galatians 6, 7. See, it gets quiet in here, right? Because you start thinking about, oh my word, you mean people do that in their heart? Yeah, all the time. All the time. They know God exists. They hear the gospel and they're like, you can keep it. I don't even believe in you. I don't believe in God. Which is bull. Their own logic breaks down if you've ever done anything in that area thought about it long enough. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will also reap. So I'll close with this. Forfeiture of one's salvation is a very real, solemn issue we must receive fully from Holy Scripture. It can happen before physical death. And that is hard. It may be a tough pill to swallow, but if we just step back for a moment and understand what's implied, we will be compelled to adopt 
the righteous viewpoint. Namely, that this type of rejection of God's commandments is disgusting and worthy of every bit of punishment a person will receive for it. An apostate, that person who forfeits salvation, is someone who dismisses the holy, sovereign God of the universe to his face. The person who lives in Timbuktu, I hate to pick up Timbuktu, who's never heard the gospel, who's never read the Bible, they still go to hell, and it's deserved. But what about the person who spends 10 years in a church like this, and it goes like this to God? Mm -hmm. That punishment is worse. Not only will it be worse than hell, they also forfeit their salvation before they even die. Yeah. And you know what? When you think of I get mad. I want to punch that person in the face. It's not my right. No, I'm for real. You mean you're thumbing the holy sovereign God of the universe? You deserve to be punched in the throat. Honestly. You deserve hell. And when you're there, remember. Remember the rich man, Lazarus. Remember it. Because you're a disrespectful fool. When you think about apostasy and someone dismissing to the holy sovereign God's face, you think of utter disrespect and deservedness of God's full wrath. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being here this morning. Thank you for truth that sets us free, and thank you for giving us difficult things to ponder. They are your way. Our ways are not your ways, Father. Our thoughts are not yours. Thank you for giving us yours. We just ask for blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, to our families, Father, and your will be done to a world that needs it so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.